Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you this morning to our YouTube channel here. And uh, if you haven't already done so, if you would consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell, we would love to have you uh, join and subscribe and stay current with our ministry here. When we go live from our assembly building on Sunday mornings, as well as when we create content midweek. So I did not make a video last week. Um, <clears throat> I did not have time because I'm working on some other things that you will uh, see on this channel next week. But I did want to make a quick video uh, this morning. Our featured book currently is my newest release. And apparently I didn't, there we go, uh, From This Generation Forever, Volume 1, Inspiration, The Study of God's Promise to Preserve His Word. This is the first 27 lessons of my class from this generation forever that I've been teaching to the adult Sunday school class at Grace Life Bible Church for at least the last five or six years. We just finished lesson, uh, I believe, 178 a couple weeks ago, which is what I'll be talking about here shortly in a moment. So please consider picking up from this generation forever as a way of helping to support the ministry. Also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. We established this last year as an alt tech site to YouTube should something happen to our YouTube ministry. So uh, please consider uh, subscribing to us or tracking with us there as well. So uh, two weeks ago, almost on May 15, I taught the final class, not final overall, but final for the current term, uh, lesson 178, the uh, pre-1611 evidence for the text, final thoughts on BOT 1602 and the King James Bible. So since last uh, September 2021, we've been in our current term. And what we've been focusing on this entire time from September now through May to May 15 when I made this video is really looking at the primary work in progress documents for the King James Bible and really trying to get an understanding about what happened, what we can know versus what we can't know, and really trying to get a, a handle on that. Now, I want to be real clear about something. We can see a lot from Bot 1602, Manuscript 98, and the Notes of Boyce, which I haven't covered yet in this series. That'll be where I start when we reboot again in September after a break. Um, we can see a lot about what they did. We don't always know why they did what they did. However, we, just being able to see what they did does tell us quite a bit, okay? It, it really informs a lot. It would be nice to know why they did what they did. And in some cases, you it's pretty clear. You can figure it out, uh, whether by looking at the, uh, you know, the Greek, uh, the bees in Greek or, or you know, looking at other other things. Sometimes you're able to discern why they did what they did. But we can see a lot about why what they did and the process they used and how that process unfolded all right and we've i've gone through all that information in great detail in these lessons all right now in this particular video as i said the final thoughts i concluded the term by looking at some work here from lawrence vance and this is what i just want to cover here briefly so the last point in the notes for this term was vance on the making of the king james new testament in 2015, Vance wrote this book, The Making of the King James Bible New Testament. Now, one of the unique things about Vance is Vance is a King James Bible believer. And so he is looking at the primary work in progress documents, not from a pre presupposition of unbelief in the King James, but from a presupposition of, of belief in it. In other words, he's a defender of the traditional text and the King James Bible. And so his work, different from possibly Norton's work, which I believe is equally as important, David Norton and the A Textual History of the King James Bible, absolutely important book, okay, don't don't get me wrong, but Nor Norton is interesting, sorry, uh, Vance is interesting here, because he's a, the, the, the pr approach that he's taking. So his book here, The Making of the King James Bible New Testament, is absolutely essential reading, because what because Vance is also discussing and dealing with the primary work in progress documents. And this is where I ended the class. And I think it's important for you to see this book. So this was written in 2015 by Vance. And he did a complete collation of the New Testament 
the AV New Testament with the Bishop's 1602, which was the base text. And he's got a collation in this book of the entire thing that he presents. So you can see here on the screen uh, what it looks like. So you can see here a, uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the AV, the time, bishops, this is the, this is the. So he's noting all of the differences between a 1602 bishop's Bible and a AV 1611, because the AV came from the bishops. That has been proved beyond doubt uh, throughout the class, throughout this current term. So any idea that the bishop's Bible, or that they did, the translators didn't follow rule number one, just is not true, all right? And so Vance has gone through and done a collation of these things here in this book, a, uh, a textual history of the King James Bible. And Anybody who's interested in this topic needs to needs to pick up Vance's work. And so while I'm talking about this, I also want to mention Vance's most recent thing. I'm going to go to his website. At the top of his website here, he talks about the text of the King James Bible is being released in uh, Fasils. Fasils, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 are available, and you can order here. So I have all of those chapters right here, okay? The text of the King James Bible, I've got chapter 4, I've got chapter 3, and I've got chapters 1 through 2. Now, the idea is if you buy these from Vance now in uh, sort of uh, ancillary form or subscription form, the way the books used to be uh, sold quite uh, often, if you buy each chapter as it's released, when he's done, you will get a nice bound copy of the whole book complimentary without having to, to, to buy it. But his work... In the, in, in the text of the King James Bible is absolutely essential reading because Vance is going through everything here and just doing a, a tremendous job of cataloging things, uh, noting things. And so um, you got to be, if you're into this thing, in, into this topic, you got to be tracking with Vance because Vance is a King James Bible believer who is into the primary work in progress documents. And I would also add that I haven't looked at it yet. He has a third edition of the King, uh, King James, his Bible and his translators that he has updated as a result of this huge research project that he's involved in. All right. You got to be reading Vance if you're interested in this topic. So I want to just end the video or cover how we ended things. Okay. So Vance also addressed the topic of Bod 1602's impact on the King James Bible in his 2015 publication, The Making of the King James Bible New Testament. Regarding uh, the indisputable connection between the 1602 Bishop's Bible and the AV, Vance states the following. This is on pages 51 and 52. He says, quote, there are two ways we know the 1602 Bishop's was the basis for the authorized version. First is the internal evidence, the sheer number of verses in which the authorized version, uh, in which the authorized version that match verbatim with the text of the 1602 Bishop's Bible. This will be seen in the collation of the New Testament of six uh, New Testament of the 1602 Bishop's Bible and the 1611 authorized version in the next section of the book. So when he talks about that, he's talking about this collation right here. He does this for the entire New Testament, Matthew through Revelation. Okay. Now, a second, the external evidence, a, a 1602 Bishop's Bible used by the King James translators currently cataloged in the Bodleian Library as Bible in English 1602 B, B colon 1 or period 1. The Bodleian Bishop's Bible, as it is called, is a 1602 Bishop's Bible with annotations of the King James translators that indicate change to be made to the Bishop's Bible. It is quote, the only known survivor of the 40 large church Bibles that were supplied by Robert Barker to the King James translators. Together with Manuscript 98 at uh, the Lambeth Palace Library, the rec that records the translator's work on the New Testament epistles, it shows the translators at work as they transform the Bishop's Bible of 1602 into the authorized version of 1611. These two things are more fully discussed in the analysis section of this book. So, Vance, as you can see there, has paid attention, like we've tried to do on this channel and in my class, to the primary work in progress documents and understand what they tell us about the process, all right? 
Having investigated both the Old and New Testament portions of Bot 1602 as well as Manuscript 98, prudence dictates that we consider some summative takeaways. To accomplish this task, we will be looking at the analysis section of Dr. Vance's 2015 work. Prior to the analysis, at the back of the book, Dr. Vance provides a complete collation of a 1602 Bishop's Bible with a 1611 AV for the entirety of the New Testament. And again, you can see a sample of that collation right here, and that is all in the 2015 book, The Making of the King James Bible New Testament by Vance. Okay, Now, what's he say? Check out the statistics. The collation of the New Testament and of the authorized version of 1611 with the Bishop's Bible of 1602 yields the following results. Of the 7,957 verses in the New Testament, the authorized version reads exactly, verbatim, exactly, with the Bishop's Bible in 2,102 of them, 26.4%. So a quarter of the King James New Testament is exactly identical to the Bishop's 1602 Bishop's Bible New Testament. Thus, it reads different in 5,855 of them, or 73%, 0.6 of the text. Of the verses that differ, 2,225 of them, 38%, have only one simple change. 1,602 of them, 27.4, have two simple changes. 999 of them, 15.7, have three simple changes. 402 of them, 7.2%, have uh, I lost the line there. Have four simple changes. I think I said four here. I meant three. <clears throat> One hundred ninety-one of them have three point three percent, three or three point three percent have five simple changes. Eighty-five of them, one point five, have six simple changes. Sixty-five of them, one point one, have seven or more simple changes, and three hundred thirty-six of them, five point seven, have complex changes. So the total changes come to 12,812 in these verses with changes that average, uh, <clears throat> sorry, in those verses with changes, the average number of changes per verse is 2.19, all right? So you can see Vance, and now here's a picture of the statistics. So here we have the total number of verses, we have the number of changes, we have the percent changed, we have how many were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven changes, and then how many have complex changes, and then we have the average changes per verse over here, okay? So you can see Vance has done a yeoman's job here of tracking with all this stuff and trying to catalog all of this in the data, all right? Now, so the following is an explanation of the table, all right? And what I want, I'm going to leave it to this a link to these notes in the description for this video, but I want to jump right here, just cut to the chase. I don't want this to be a super long video. The approximate percent of the text of the authorized version New Testament that basically reads as a bishop's Bible is 91%. So if you go to the bottom corner here, the total, you can see 91% is the correlation between the bishop's and the AV. 91% of the King James New Testament comes from the Bishop's Bible. 91%. So any idea that they didn't follow Rule 1, the translators didn't follow Rule 1, and they didn't use the Bishop's Bible is just not true. All right? And let me just say this. There's the idea, well, the King James, depends who you read, is anywhere between 80 to 90% Tyndall. And some people will instinctually sort of like argue against a statistic like this, um, that there's so much confluence between the Bishop's Bible and the um, King James. And the reason for that is because there's a fundamental lack of understanding in the minds of some about what actually happened historically. All right. So track with me, if you will. The King James is a revision of the bishops. The bishops is a revision of the Great Bible. The Great Bible was a revision by Coverdale of the Matthews Bible. And the Matthews Bible by John Rogers is the complete work of William Tyndall. Rogers in the Matthews Bible furnished, the complete, furnished for us the complete work of William Tyndall. And what I mean by the complete work of William Tyndall is in the, in the Matthews Bible, I have one on the shelf behind me here, you have 
Tyndall's Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy. You have Joshua through Second Chronicles. You have Jonah, and then you have the entire New Testament. So the, Matthew's Bible is the complete work of William Tyndall. All the translational efforts that Tyndall had, had completed before he was martyred are in the Matthew's Bible. When Coverdale went to create the Great Bible, he revised the Matthew's Bible, the complete work of William Tyndall. Then you have the Great Bible, then you have the Bishop's Bible, then you have the King James Bible, but that, that, that stream of official revision within the Anglican Church that ends up with the King James starts with Coverdale and the Great Bible, which is a revision of Matthew's, the complete work of William Tyndall. So there's a Tyndalian line going all the way through there. So yes, it's true. Both things are true. There's a high degree of confluence between the King James and Tyndall and the King James and the Bishop's Bible because of that whole stream of revision that occurred there between, uh, let's see, 1539 with the Great Bible all the way through to uh, 1611. And in fact, I've shown not only in these videos, but also in the class lessons, that there are verses in the King James that you're reading right now in 2022 that read exactly the same way a great Bible read in 1539 because they just went through, all the way through that process unchanged. So it's really a fascinating thing to consider all these things. All right. Now, I am right now going to be taking a summer break from this class. This is my last sort of reason for making this video. So if you are wanting to get caught up on this content, if you're wanting to go through all of these lessons, I'm going to be updating here this blog spot, which is sort of the unofficial official class website. And you can see I've got some updating to do. I last added lesson 170 and I just taught lesson 178. So I'm going to try to take care of that before the end of the week. But if you want to go through this material and get caught up before we resume class again in the summer, I'm sorry, in the, in the fall, in September, uh, please, I strongly would urge you to do that. You're not going to be disappointed by getting this information into your frame of reference, all right? Now, this summer, I'm going to be taking time, like I always do, to read ahead before the next school year starts for me. So I'm going to be reading ahead. And in the meantime, there's going to be other men teaching the adult Sunday school class at church, at Grace Life Bible Church. Some of those men are going to elect to live stream. In fact, coming up in June, we have a large, a six-part study on biblical archaeology that one of the saints at our church, Brother Bud Chrysler, is going to be talking about here. Um, so that starts the first Sunday in June, so that's right around the corner. Other men throughout the summer, they may or may not want their lessons live streamed. But while all that is going on and I'm working with those brethren, I'm trying to build some teaching capacity in them for uh, local church ministry, um, I will be reading ahead and studying on issues related to this. And my plan is that when we resume in September, the first topic I'm going to talk about is the notes of voice. That's sort of the, the, the other outstanding work in progress primary document that we've mentioned We've said some things about it back in January, but we haven't really rolled up our sleeves on it and looked at how it informs this process. So that's just sort of an update. You got to check out the work here of Lawrence Vance. Again, the making of the King James Bible New Testament, and also the work here on the text of the King James Bible, if you're into this subject matter, all right? Before you go, if you would consider uh, leaving a comment, liking, sharing this video, help getting the word out about this channel, we would certainly appreciate that. If you haven't already done so, if you would also consider picking up a copy of the From This Generation Forever Volume 1 Notes on Inspiration, we would certainly appreciate that. And I just want to remind you about uh, what's going on on this channel with the rebroadcasting of the Grace History Project. Every Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning at 9 a.m. here on this channel, we are well up into the 80s now on the number of lessons that are in this playlist. If you're interested in the history of dispensationalism um, or the word rightly divided, I would, cons I would strongly consider that you check this out as well. And I also want to remind you about our Bible reading challenge here at Grace Life Bible Church, where we're reading through Paul's epistles every month for all of the year 2022. There are two videos here explaining the challenge, a couple different uh, options here for reading. 
And then there are links here to King James Readers Bibles if you're interested in picking one of those up. So next week, there's going to be a lot of activity on this channel as I've been working on something. And um, I still have a few things to finish up. So you're going to want to uh, stay tuned for what is going to be going on with that. So thank you as always for tuning in. Before you leave, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, if you've never acknowledged the fact that your sin separates you from God, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin, shed his blood, paid the price necessary to redeem you eternally to himself, you need to trust Jesus Christ and the, his finished work, his death, burial, and resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. He died on the cross for your sin, was buried, rose again according to the scriptures, and when you place faith in his atoning work for you, on Calvary, he will give you eternal life as a free gift. You'll pass from death to life. You'll be taken out from under the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. You'll be sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your attention, and we'll see you next time.